Tank from London, England was formed in 1980 by bassist Algie Ward after being let go from UK punk band The Damned. With Algie also handling vocals, he'd be joined by the Brabs brothers, Peter on guitar and Mark on drums, and record a three-track demo that got the attention of A&R rep for DJM Records, Nick Raymond, who asked to see the band perform live. We had no gigs planned, so our manager invited Nick to a rehearsal. And after hearing us play just three songs, Shell Shock, Don't Walk Away, and Stormtrooper, he offered to sign us on the spot. Nick signed us to DJM, but because of DJM's middle of the road image, it was agreed by both parties to set up camouflage records within DJM, specifically for Tank and for all future new wave of British heavy metal signings. In September of 1981, Tank would put out their first release, a three track single to coincide with a tour of Europe supporting Motorhead. The A-side, Don't Walk Away, is a very straightforward rocker and decent enough, but the other two cuts stand out way more to me, including Hammer On, which never appeared on an album. following year, in March of 1982, Tank would release their first studio album, Filth Hounds of Hades. There's a strong punk energy on Filth Hounds of Hades that's more focused and controlled, delivered here with speedy, aggressive riffs by Peter, who also lays down some really nice solos. Definitely Motorhead similarities too, especially with Motorhead guitarist Fast Eddie Clark producing the album. Hounds of Hades is very solid overall, but there are certain tracks that stand out more to me than others, including Turn Your Head Around. It has the same infectious tank energy as the rest of the album, but this track is perhaps the highlight for me with its speedy riff and catchy headbanging chorus. Another standout track for me is Heavy Artillery, 
again with a motorhead kind of vibe and straightforward but heavy riffing. But some stuff just doesn't work quite as well for me, like Who Needs Love Songs? And a couple, too, are still enjoyable, but didn't grab me like Turn Your Head Around or Heavy Artillery did. a short five months after Filth Hounds of Hades, Tank would release their second album, Power of the Hunter. Hey, what's going on in your mind? kicks off with perhaps the best track off the album, the excellent Walking Barefoot Over Glass. It has this slight British invasion quality to it before going into an excellent catchy chorus. Where did I get all this While I love the opening track, I have to be honest, the majority of Power of the Hunter doesn't do a lot for me. Overall, it's along the same lines as Filth Hounds of Hades, but a lot of the first half comes off as pretty uneventful. Although the guitar playing here is still a highlight, especially on the fantastic instrumental, Tank, right in the middle of the album. The second half does rock a little harder than the first though, and I found myself enjoying a few tracks a little more after a few listens. a Donny Osmond cover that I'm not too crazy about, the album ends with a couple more tracks that lean heavily into the Motorhead vein, which certainly isn't bad, but at this point, Tank needed something different to help them stand out. In order to help achieve this, they'd bring on second guitarist Mick Tucker. 
The main reason to add a second guitarist was to boost the sound power of our live shows, and in some small way we hoped that by being a four-piece, it would rid us of the Sons of Motorhead tag that the British press insisted on using. This new four-piece lineup would move over to Music for Nations and record Tank's third album, This Means War, in 1983, this time with a much clearer heavy metal sound and a cool keyboard intro. On one hand, it still sounds completely like Tank, with the aggressive, driving riffs and high energy from the previous albums. But this album pulls way back on the punk qualities and instead brings in far more of a heavy metal feel to the songwriting. Just like something from And along with the bigger sound in general, Mick Tucker's flashier guitar playing is another major component in the shifting style, alternating some outstanding solos with Peter. I like Filth Hounds of Hades a lot for what it is, but this is where Tank really kicks in for me, with some very powerful entries, including the awesome title track. Again, I think the solos are killer on here, with the dual guitarist approach making a huge difference. The second side of the album is a bit more mixed, starting off with Laughing in the Face of Death, which highlights the speedier side of Tank. Tracks If We Go, We Go Down Fighting and I Won't Ever Let You Down are more straightforward, but they're still really solid, even if they don't hit as hard as some of the stuff on side one. This Means War is a great album that straddles the early Tank sound with the more 80s metal vibe of their later releases. However, following This Means War, the Brabs brothers would both leave. 
Pete was suffering from the usual rock and roll afflictions, which had started to seriously affect his playing. So Algie and Mick decided to sack him. I thought Pete should have been given a chance to sort himself out, but it wasn't to be. For me, Tank was and always will be Algie, Pete, and me. So it felt like the heart of the band had been ripped out. I quit the very next morning. They'd be replaced by guitarist Cliff Evans and drummer Graham Crowley to record Tank's fourth album, Honor and Blood. This is another super solid album that essentially follows the formula from This Means War, with seven tracks and a synthesizer intro, and for the most part maintains that traditional heavy metal approach they'd started exploring the year before. And the dual guitar playing continues to be stellar on here, with awesome solo battles between Mick and Cliff. Blood is definitely more produced than Tank's rough and ready early albums, but it works really well overall and doesn't get in the way of the creative riffing and fantastic choruses, including another kick ass title track. Overall, Honor and Blood is really fun and consistently enjoyable, although I could personally do without the cover of Aretha Franklin's Chain of Fools, which for me is kind of a bizarre speed bump on an otherwise pretty lively album. The rest of Side 2 works much better for me though. The commercial touches get really apparent here and I know that turns some listeners off, but for me, it's still some great stuff. Well, look at me now. There are tears in my eyes and it's three in the morning I never know how you can say you're in love and then push me away I'm wasting my life away yeah. A couple of these are definitely exploring some lighter and simpler territory but they show another side to Tank and offer something a little different from the rest of the album. But the closing track in particular does an awesome job of combining these two directions, utilizing some catchy, almost poppy touches. into a proper growly tank chorus with a nice punchy riff. Tank 
Tank would get dropped by Music for Nations after this, and Graham would only stick around for the one album, eventually being replaced by Gary Taylor. Afterwards, Tank would get picked up by GWR and put out their self-titled fifth album, Tank. Despite a boring, uninspiring cover and a slight dip in production, there's still a lot I like on this album. have the major heavy metal tracks of other Tank albums, but it's still really solid overall, with some great songwriting and catchy choruses. Plus, you guessed it, freaking awesome solos. contemporary, arguably more mainstream sound is even more apparent on this album, and I can again see it being a deterrent to some Tank fans, along with the overall slower pace of the music. But for me, this album is a nice balance of late 80s hard rock, heavy riffs, and really nice songwriting. That said, tracks toward the middle of the album, like The Enemy Below, are just okay and the lackluster ballad, Lost, lives up to its name by being pretty forgettable. But things pick right back up with the last two tracks of the album, The Hell They Must Suffer and It Fell From The Sky. Neither of which is gonna melt anyone's face off, but they're both great tracks. However, something would cause Tank to break up shortly after this, and it wouldn't be until 1997, with an invitation to play the Vakken Open Air Festival, that they'd get back together. Algy would reunite with Mick and Cliff and bring on drummer Steve Hopgood and try to figure out how to fit all their best songs in a limited featured set. It is difficult playing everything that uh, you know, people want to hear and you know what. It's um, a pretty good selection, a good, oh, good yeah. cross section of all the different songs. Yeah. So, you know, it keeps everyone happy. Mm. Not the guys in Raven saying, how come you're not doing life in the face of death? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the water eggs are wrong, you know. But, you know, we've only got uh, 30, 30, 30 minutes or 40 to 40, 40 minutes, and, and the water eggs are wrong. It's eight Seven. minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> so when we come back, we do the full set. Yeah. This is just a you know, it's a reintroduced tank to everyone, so they know we're back. The next time we do the full tour, full show. So have you planned uh, to rec uh, record some new songs in the near future? Yeah, we have. We've uh, already done a uh, three-track uh, three demo and um, we were just looking for a deal. I've uh, been talking to a lot of people, or people have been talking to us, I should say. After switching to drummer Bruce Bisland and eventually getting signed to Zoom Club Records, Tank would finally release their sixth album, Still at War, in 2002, 15 years after their last one. Ultimately, Still at War is just okay. There is stuff I like on it, but there are also tracks on here that are kind of a slog to get through. And the solos are still very good, but also somewhat underwhelming compared to previous efforts. The opening title track and Light the Fire are highlights early on, as well as the closer, The Fear Inside. But the standout track to me is easily Return of the Filth Hounds, an explosive entry with the clearest connection to the band's earlier material. I'd love to have heard more stuff like this on Still at War, but unfortunately, the cracks within the band were already growing, and I think it shows in the music. There would be some headway made on another album, but further internal disagreements would lead to Tank breaking up for good. Sort of. In 2008, Mick Tucker and Cliff Evans would recruit Mark Brabs for a new version of Tank, along with Bruce Dickinson's solo bassist Chris Dale, and vocalist Dougie White. With original member Mark Brabs involved, using the name Tank at least makes a little sense, but he'd be replaced within the year by drummer Dave Cavill, and this lineup would get picked up by a Polish label called Metal Mind Productions to release War Machine in 2010 as Tank. War Machine is good, but not great. It's more cohesive overall than Still at War, but it still pales in comparison to the 80s Tank albums. This version of Tank is pretty grounded musically, but there are glimpses of a more power-focused style and light Iron Maiden influences in tracks like Phoenix Rising. Doogie is 
much more of a Dio type singer compared to Algy's growly vocals. So it does kind of make you wonder why they didn't just start over under a new band name with their own identity, although I do understand wanting the name recognition. I wasn't able to find out what the right situation was at the time, but it seems that Mick and Cliff were able to use the name, although the result is, again, quite different from what you might expect from Tank. They'd end up bringing drummer Steve Hopgood back on board after this and follow up War Machine with War Nation in 2012. While it feels like even more of a departure from the original Tank, this album was at least nice enough to provide a music video. War Nation isn't bad, but very little stands out to me on it. Musically, it's even more dialed back than War Machine, and I get a lot of old school vibes like Dio with Black Sabbath or Coverdale era Deep Purple, but mixed with some modern touches. The entire album is at an even mid-tempo, and for me, aside from the occasional solo, I found it rather dull overall. As for Algy, it does seem there were maybe some health problems that kept him from touring, and that may have been a large part of what caused the rift between him and Mick and Cliff. But it didn't keep him from recording material, and in 2013, Algy would release Breath of the Pit as his own version of Tank, this time with himself as the only band member. So that's Algy on guitar, bass, drums, and vocals, and again, I don't know what the legal standing was on the name rights, but this one does have two copyright symbols on the cover for good measure. The drums are rough and the production is messy, but the music does have way more aggression and attitude than the Tucker Evans version of Tank. But at the end of the day, it's not a great album, and in a lot of ways, it actually feels more like a demo than a proper release. 
Like, more than one track on here is borderline unlistenable just from a technical standpoint. But there are some interesting ideas here and there, and whether they work or not, Breath of the Pit at least is willing enough to try them out. For their third album, Cliff Evans and Mick Tucker would bring in a new lineup, this time with bassist Baron Corbois, drummer Bobby Shotkowski, and ex-Dragon Force vocalist Z.P. Thart, and this lineup would release Valley of Tears in 2015. I will say that overall, Valley of Tears is more my jam compared to War Nation, with more of a modern style that ZP's clean vocals are a nice fit for. By and large, it's fairly standard stuff, and while it is an easy listen, I can't say that any specific tracks really jumped out for me, although I suppose Living a Fantasy came closest. Also, Valley of Tears did get two music videos this time, with the second one set in Texas for some reason. But apparently the bar they're visiting isn't open yet, so they decide to just rock out in the parking lot. Although I do also have to point out the instrumental album Closer, One for the Road, which is pretty cool and has a subtle Satriani kind of vibe. So your opinion may vary on this one, but for me, it's pretty decent overall, but hit or miss on individual tracks. In 2018, Algae would release a second album under the tank name with Sturm Panzer. And unfortunately, it's almost impossible to review. From a production perspective, it's really difficult to listen to. If you've ever downloaded a low quality audio file from a file sharing program, that's essentially what this entire album sounds like. The Evans and Tucker version would pick up Randy Vander Elsen on bass and David Redmond on vocals to put out one more Tank album in 2019 called Reignition.
for being essentially just a collection of re-recorded songs from the 80s Tank albums, I gotta say, Reignition is pretty badass. It absolutely retains the inherent energy of the originals, but they're tighter and cleaner with a modern sound that genuinely brings something new to every track. And I think David's vocals are a great fit for this revisit of Tank Classics, providing a powerful but just gritty enough delivery. One thing they overlooked is just one final fact. They didn't realize that we'll come fighting back. Just like something from hell. Just like something. I guess it could partly be because I'm more familiar with these songs, or it could be a testament to the quality of the songwriting, but I think this is clearly the liveliest, most energetic output of the Tucker Evans Tank, with some of the best, most passionate 21st century Tank solos. shame that Algy couldn't have been involved on bass, especially since he at least co-wrote every song on here. Because this is a great retrospective of Tank's catalog, and I'd say their best release since their initial breakup. Reunion would never happen though, and sadly, Algy Ward would pass away in 2023 from undisclosed health issues. The Tucker Evans version of Tank is still active, although as of 2023 they've brought on drummer Mark Cross, bassist Gavin Gray, and vocalist Marcus Von Boisman. They haven't released any material yet, but if they can capture the energy from Reignition with original songs, I'd definitely be interested. But for now, that is Tank, all three versions. For your homework, be sure to check out Filth Hounds of Hades from 1982, This Means War from 1983, Honor and Blood from 1984, Tank from 1987, and Reignition from 2019. For extra credit, Power of the Hunter from 1982 is worth a listen even if it's only for Walking Barefoot Over Glass and the self-titled instrumental track. And I'd also toss on Still at War from 2002, plus War Machine from 2010 and Valley of Tears from 2019 if you like what you heard here. I hope you enjoyed this look back at Tank, an early British metal band that delivered some uniquely heavy albums and then split up, literally. But they do have some fantastic stuff that is well worth your time, and I encourage you to give their 80s albums a listen. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Thank you very much, Tokyo. Good night.